Hi, everyone. Today is episode three of Anne and a Fan. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and I hope you guys have some gardening questions today because I have with me here a master gardener, Becky Kaiser. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of fun stuff related to gardening. So if you know what plant zone you are in, um, if you have a question about gardening, throw that in there as well. And then she can um, answer your questions about gardening. And uh, uh, we'll move on if we have time to Mexico where she goes regularly, dang her, and enjoy some beach time down, uh, I think it's Cozumel, right, Becky? Cozumel, Playa Cozumel. and even Puerto Vallarta. That's right. All right, so hi, Heather. Hello to everybody. Jackie Rogers, if you're here, you better be watching because we're starting the show right away just for you, Jackie. Anyway. Everybody, this is Becky, and uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, I met Becky, oh boy, I don't even know how many years ago, Becky, it's been a long time. Was it in Deadwood, though? It was in Deadwood. I want to say it's maybe was your second year. You guys were before Deadwood, out at the that resort. Right, right. And I'm trying to remember the resort. Come on. Oh, okay. a fancy one out there. Oh, gosh, we've That's done so much. Spa. Room or oh, you know, oh, it was spa. at the spa, Aquila Spa. Yes. Yeah. So we were out there and we did a signing out there that time. Black Hills Executive Lodging had us and we did a That's signing right. there. So, um, yeah. And that was the first time you and Lowell came to one of our signings and or my signings. And I met you guys and you were a blast. And you guys have been coming back to Deadwood ever since every year. We certainly have. So that's so much fun. So let's get started. Um, Let's talk about, first of all, my question is, you're a master gardener. Yes. What is a master gardener and how do you become one? Well, um, in Minnesota, we have one of the largest amounts of master gardeners in the country, which is amazing because we're a cold zones. We're a zone anywhere from zone three to maybe a low 5A. So, that's a shorter growing season for most of you that are right. all around everywhere else. But anyways, I was, I, said, I think I had turned 40. And I said, I had a bucket list and become a master gardener was it. So I went and checked with my local county uh, extension office and I had to go do an interview, say why I want to be one, mm -hmm. what I want to do with it. And then from there I was accepted and you go to here in Minnesota, the University of Minnesota. It's like Hort 101. So I went for like, I'm going to say six, seven Saturdays in a row, eight hours a day. And I listened to professor after professor after professor, you know, saying one did bugs, you know, oh. one did birds, one did bushes, trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals. And no, you don't have to be an expert at all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just enough to be dangerous some days. Because right. uh, everybody has a specialty. So then once you go through the core course is what it's called. Then the first year you need to volunteer back to your community 50 hours of community service and then after that it's 25 hours per year and then also five to seven hours of more classroom training you know different garden shows and talks that you go to right um, so our mission in life is to give back to our community to educate the public on how to take care of plants, how to take care of their shrubs and trees, how to grow those vegetables and how to split perennials, propagate, depending on what it is. Um, everybody has kind of a niche. Mine is happens to be succulents, vegetables, perennials, uh, seed starting. So different things like that and propagating, which is very fun and exciting. It's not for everybody, but I like cool. it. Cool. So how long was it a year long of taking these classes that it, you know, before you were, you got a certificate or something? Months. Two months. Okay. Two months. And then you got a certificate in the mail that says you're a master gardener. Um, you kind of get it right away. Then you join, I had joined, um, there's a master gardener group that meets once a month. So when we go, uh, even when you're in the core course, you can start going to those meetings and of course, you're with people, I'm going to say the age group tends to be more 40 to 80. Uh-huh. Because they have this experience and the knowledge. And what worked 
50 years ago might not work today because of the chemicals and soil and just what's going on in, you know, with rain, not rain, you know. What right. We? So uh, you just you just go and you learn. And every time you think that you thought you knew what you knew, you're like, yeah. oh. nope. Nope. <laughs> nope, I don't know. So then you're a master gardener. So do you do, do you get contacted to go do volunteer things at different places? Come, come talk to this group about such and such. Yes. With um, a lot of the grade schools around here, which is really neat that they've started gardens for these little children. I mean, we're talking kindergarten, first, second, third, very, very young. And they learn about prepping the soil. They learn about planting seeds, how to care for the garden. And of course, what do we get to eat? What do we get to graze on? Oh, so it's really, really cool. And that is a passion of mine is teaching the young kids um, how gratifying it is to plant, to plant right. fall, plant that seed in the fall and know that it's going to come up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I've got some pictures that um, Becky sent to me ahead of time so we can just flash through and whatever you want to talk about with each of them. Well, I decided this little area, it's like the west corner of our home, needed a spot because we have people that are walking past our yard all the time. And they always seem to stop there because it's shady, even though you see the sun shining in there because it was first thing in the morning. So right. the sign isn't up there where you can see it. But I did put a, a sign out there saying, this is where you can stop and drop and just uh, take a seat, relax, leave your worries behind and just sit and just rest. Nice. And I can see some of the, these are succulents, right? Like the, um, are this hostas? Is that what I'm seeing? Yes. You're seeing some, ha the hanging baskets are all succulents. And then you see hostas, you see all kinds of different shade things. You see a tiger's eye sumac, some different grasses. Yeah. I have a, I have a variety and this bed here probably is about 80 feet long, actually. This wow. It's the front of the house. Wow. Okay. Let's look at another one of your pictures. Here's another one. What are yeah. we looking at? So this is my front yard. We're on a corner. So I, Lowell, when we were building the house, Lowell's like, why is there a big dump truck dropping off about 150 yards of dirt? And I said, cause I'm making a berm. He goes, Becky, we're not even in the house yet. I go, but we'll be, I'll be needing to plant anytime soon. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have perennials and I have an apricot tree that you see there in the middle that my mm -hmm. grandson Isaac and I planted together when it was a, a, a stick, literally mm -hmm. like six years ago. He stood out there at that tree all summer long going, when do we get apricots? When are you making syrup? <laughs> oh, come on, hurry up, Grandma. That's funny. Okay, so let's look at the next one. What's the, is this more of that berm? Yep, with the different, the way the sun comes in and, you know, and since that picture's been taken, I actually redesigned uh, about 90% of that bed. I just moved some things around because things wow. tend to drift with birds planting fertilized seeds. Oh, I see. They help you out. They help you out. Okay. okay. So this is behind. This is one of your planter boxes you build, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is on the southwest side of my home and it acts like a zone nine and 10, which is something you could probably relate to. So I have in the rocks, I have a lot of my different succulents and what have you. But this patio we never used because it was so hot. And so during COVID, I said, guess what we're doing today? And Lonely goes, what? I said, we're building a 22 foot long raised bed. Wow. You know, we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're going to be my gopher and I'm going to be building it. I've already got the plans drawn out everything. So, yeah, we put that out there. So that's extra growing. I mean, I do have other raised beds gardening, but I do so much right there. And right where those patio doors is, my office is right in there. So that's my pleasure to come out during my lunch hour and pick and we right. just, Hey, pop a, grab a cherry, tomato. Yeah. Something. yeah. Okay. What about, let's see what's next. So oh. this is at your front. Yeah, this is out the front and I have two ponds, which I'm now consolidating into one pond. And so that's just kind of looking down from my porch. Oh, wow. Look at that. I can see the, so the little pond in there, is there a fountain in there? Or is it just a pond? Well, I do have a fountain in there. I did not have it turned down for the picture, but for me late at night, when you hear that water trickling is very soothing and relaxing. Now, is there anything where you need to have a pond versus just water? I mean, a, a fountain versus just a pond sitting there so for the plants or for the any mosquitoes, something like that? 
Well, it helps for aeration, yes, and it kind of helps mosquito larvae, but I have ducks that that fly in there. I have all kinds of younger birds that'll come in there and they like that pond because it's a little more quiet and secluded. They don't have too many predators. We have a lot of hawks nearby. So they can come in there and kind of hide mm-hmm. and come out when they want. And the tree that's in the background, it's a weeping mulberry. And normally those branches are cut all, they're all the way down to the ground. So it hides a, a lot of my birds from the predators, eagles and the hawks. So they use that tree a lot. Oh, nice. See, I like how you're even thinking about how the wildlife works with the plants that you put out, not just, it's so complicated, Becky. I don't know how you do that because you got to think about the zone and what, you know, how that affects how much sun and then um, the wildlife and and helping them, you know, and all that kind of stuff and how it's going to look, the layout, you know, that's important too when you're putting all your lawn. Oh my gosh, you're just amazing. Someday I'm going to come there and I'm going to see this all in person. Look at, okay, so what's this? What you're showing? Well, it's Adam's needle is one form of the name, but this is these are the yucca plants that you see growing all around the hills in South Dakota. And you can see them from far off when they get their bloom, as you can see that bloom that's up there. And when it, I mean, that thing is probably about eight feet tall. That's how tall that spot wow. is. So it's amazing. And when it dries out, it can be a really cool dried uh, seed pods. They kind of rattle a little bit, but... If anybody's in Minnesota, I'll be dividing that plant up this year if I get about 20 more out of there. So let me know. So that was something I was going to mention. So you're from um, central Minnesota, right? Right. Northwest of the city is about 20 miles. But you, at the same time, you have plants, you have succulents, you have all these different things, you know, things that might be down here in Arizona. So you need to go through your lawn. Sorry, let me adjust that. Go through your lawn and, or, or your yard and see, okay, how much sun am I getting? What's the temperatures? Did you like check temperatures year round kind of a thing? What can go through the winter? What can't? I mean, how detailed do you have to get? Well, you you, you got to know what your zone is. And then if you have, say, your borderline on a zone, you could be like a 4A, 4B, or 5A because this is my backyard and it gets very protected more from the Northwest winds, I can cheat that my zone a little bit here, but like that yucca, there is a zone three and four. It grows all across the Dakotas. Right. Minnesota. So it's, it's fine. It, I don't have to do anything. And there's a lot of um, succulent type like hens and chicks. You know, you see a lot of those are very, very hardy. There's some varieties that are more the zone seven, eight, nine, ten, like that kind of thing. Right. Um, so I bring in approximately 200 plants wow. from my basement that I overwinter. Wow. Yeah. So we purposely did not finish off all of our basement. Uh, so, and I purposely put it a southwest corner where I could have two big double windows. So I had a lot of sunlight coming in. So I bring in all my really fun agaves that I um, collect through the years and just different plants and cactuses. So they're in pots and it's kind of funny to watch me do the mad dash. Like all of a sudden I'll get, I'll be watching the news. I'm like, wait a minute, we're going to have a frost warning tonight. How bad's a frost? Oh, (laughs) it's only going to be 25 for one day. I'm probably good because some of these can be because, you know, in your area, you could have a colder night. Oh, yeah, we'll swing 40 degrees this time of year, you know, 70 in the day, 30 at night. Yeah, so I I enjoy this. And then I make up for gifts for people, um, big succulent pots. I do a, like a whole thing. I take pumpkins in the fall and I decorate the tops with succulents. And when I give that as a gift, I always tell them, don't throw it away when the pumpkin starts to go bad because it'll last like six weeks. I soak it in bleach first and the pumpkin. And I said, all you have to do is just peel off all those succulents, all those little starters. You'll see roots already starting, stick them in the ground. It's a gift that's going to keep giving. That's nice. I love that idea. Let's go to your next one. So this is the raised bed you said was on your back patio. And then this is more of a close-up of it. Right, right. Just to show some of the stuff. And what you see on the ground there are all my succulents I bring out when I'm starting to bring them out and getting used to the sun. I have to bring them out in batches because, you know, with 200 plants, yeah, I have to bring them out. So I kind of keep them there because it's shaded there until almost about three o'clock in the afternoon. So it gets them acclimated. Oh, yeah. wow. But yes, I have, um, you see, 
green beans, you see tomatoes, and I have cabbages down there. I have cucumbers growing up the vines and squash. You can see the rock hills, you know, the rock wall in the background. Right, right. Wow. Man, you're so busy with this. Okay, what's this? This is your front again, the front porch? Yeah, yeah just a corner of the porch again, just kind of overlooking. And um, like I said, it's one of our favorite spots to sit late at night, about nine o'clock. I'm not going to lie, we're probably having a little agave arrow. <laughs> a long day working on working around the yard um, i'm very fortunate i do the planting but Lil helps me with the maintaining you know early spring cleanup and late fall cleanup you've wow. got it down to a science but it, it it takes probably a good you know 15 to 20 hours straight just to, if i really clean everything up really well in the fall wow so. that's a, that's so much time it's beautiful but wow, that's a lot. So these, what is this garden? What's in there? I mean, what are the plants? Hostas, um, all different kinds of hostas. I do have lilies in there. I have different shrubs, uh, window boxes, Stella Dioro lilies. Um, I, I'm trying to think, they're kind of like little violas. I have, let them grow wild. So they just kind of spread with every which right. A couple grasses, some pentacetums. Yeah. Wow. It's got to be so beautiful. When is your yard at the best viewing time? Or does it change? Um, spring, you have all these things blooming. Yes, I do have some spring bulbs and that kind of thing. So I will have spring bulbs. But I'm going to say late June through end of July is great. And then I do have some different fall interests. By then, certain things are getting tired. Mm -hmm. you know, but then you have certain trees and shrubs that are going to start turning colors. I have a lot of ornamental grasses that turn really pretty burgundies and kind of orange colors. So I like them. I like them. I like a little bit of everything. No, I think that's great though. It changes with the season. So I might have grabbed this one twice or is this different? Nope. You've seen it. Okay. So let's look at this one. Oh, yeah. That's where we, the bench was. That's looking all the way down because you can okay. see it more shaded. And the far background, you just see the outline of my greenhouse. Mm, back in there. So it makes it very convenient. I don't heat the greenhouse. So like right now I have limited things out there because like tonight it'll be 25 degrees. Tonight. So not till my nights get about 45 degrees will I start moving all my seedlings out there. Right, right. Let's go to the next. So this is um, closer beyond, yeah. you know, we looked at your planter bed, but now we're looking at the little, the nice rock path and all. Are those succulents all in those rocks then? Yeah, the different succulents. There's a couple lazy or like black eyed Susan type of thing, but you can see all the little pots that are lower. Those are a lot of the different agaves. I, there's mm. different types of agaves that are grown in all the different states in Mexico. I don't have one from every one yet, but that's on my bucket list to finish getting. Oh, how fun from all the different, yes, Mexico, that's fun. Yes, and you can so. see that. Yeah, and see there, there's some, a lot of my succulents that I have to dig up, but then I just plant them right in the rocks just to add a little visual and just, so the digging them up and then putting them and keeping them and then putting them back in, does that affect their overall growth? Do they go, I mean, does it slow them down? Do they go backwards at all? Or just they pause during the winter? They, they take a pause because, you know, as I wait as long as I can to leave them out there because then they're going to like what I call a cooling down period. I'm not going to just dig them up all since 90 degrees and now they're in a house. Mm -hmm. I wait to, because I, I, my bees want to keep it cool at about 65. So that really helps them. It's like they're taking a breath because that is a hot, hot part of my yard. So after being in, you know, 95, 100 degrees for three months, they're going, whew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like anything else, right? Right, right. A breather. I love how you re you think of them as they need a breather, they need a break. Because I, I don't tend to think of, you know, the plant. I'm not a gardener. So it's like, well, you're sleeping during the winter, but that's all I think of them as, you know, just hanging on during the cold winter and get ready it's going to be a really cold night you know and we do we do tend to cover if we get below 10 up here uh in prescott we're in the mountains but we will take sheets out and stuff and cover some of the rosemary and different things that it's like no we're just getting too cold now we got to protect them for the night right and i and i i check on the wind we tend to be in a very windy area so if i know there's a good stiff wind you're not going to have the frost it's when you don't have the wind is when you have the damaging hard freezes and frost. So, so that must be in, in orchards as we travel. And, uh, you know, I see the fans up in the, you know, over the grapes yes. and over the, over the tree, the peach yes. trees and all that stuff are 
maybe peach. But anyway, so it's keeping that wind going so we don't get the, just the stillness and the frost with that, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I've been known to run out there and throw a few sheets out there, and Lowell's like, oh, that's not from our bed, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, honey, sorry. That's how it goes. I'm Let's like, see, I have. It will be. It's just, that's some of the stuff I, the mess I had to clean up last fall because all of a sudden all my flocks ended up at one end of the garden and all my cone flowers ended up at the other end and i'm like what the heck this is not how i planted you so <laughs> so yeah what the heck's what's going can, on thank the birds for that oh that's it so they get in there and okay so let's talk a little bit but I, I, now do you the birds, do you have a lot more that now come your way? I mean, are you, do they know come to Becky? She's got the flowers and the food and all the good stuff, the pollen. Right. Nectar. Because I purposely um, grow plants for birds and butterflies, the monarchs, because the monarchs are being decimated. So while I have those ponds there, part of that was for, it's designated as like a monarch area. So I grow milkweed, the old fashioned swamp milkweed just for that so I can collect um, the caterpillars and watch them go through the process. And I, and I, if I do get so many chrysalis, I will put them in jars and I share them with either the neighborhood kids or like my grandchildren. So they can watch this process and realize how amazing it is. Oh, nice. You need to do, and people plant things for your butterflies don't and bees and don't buy things with all the chemicals in it because it's so dangerous. They will kill them in their hives. So shallow dishes, very, very shallow dishes with water because the butterflies feel more comfortable in a shallow water. They don't feel threatened, mm. say a big pond. So I have hostas that I grow purposely. They're cupped and they're very rippled. So they hold water when it rains. So they'll come and land and do everything. I mean, I, I have times where I, I like my hydrangea bushes, I'll have hundred monarchs on there wow and it's beautiful to see that would be amazing next time i want to see a picture of that when you do that you have to send me a picture so i can just ooh and awe about that because we do get them through here too and we do have some butterfly bushes and i i don't know what their official name is i know they call them butterfly you know bushes but we do have those as well as a few other things and they'll flit around you know and and just but we are kind of i think on the pathway through not right in the thick of it but we do get them in through here and it's so fun to see them all come you know yeah i have one little granddaughter who's definitely afraid of bees even though i you know people have these sometimes kids are scared of things that they shouldn't be and i said the bees that are in my yard will never just jump up and sting you unless you you know yeah more spot them but my yard literally hums when you walk around in the summer times it's <sighs> low buzzing and humming everywhere you go because i have grapevines i have pear trees the apricot tree raspberries strawberries and so they're smelling that sugar and that sweetness but also um because i have so many different flowers for them different petunias just different things that they like dahlias the hummingbirds are thick around here so i like it so that's another educating thing that i do when the kids because i let the kids and the neighborhood come through my yard right. i love it and then I'm like, so you can stop and try that. Pick some of this herbs, chew it up, go ahead. And they're like, hey, that's chocolate mint. And I'm like, yep. Oh, wow, that's fun. So it, it, they get it interested and they say, you see that flower? Go ahead and hold it and go hold it. And there's a little bee just flying in and out of their hand. I said, nothing to it. Right, right. Just letting them know. Uh, yes. Heather had a question for you. When you bring in the succulent, how often to water them? Should you have them in a sunny window? Heather, what kind of succulent is it? Do you know what kind? We'll see if she, uh, I'll oh. wait and see if she gets a, yeah. But what you do when I, when I bring mine in, because um, depending on where they're at and if they were in ground level pots and then I lifted up the whole pot, I gotta be careful with that soil that's right on top because I could have bugs that have laid eggs in there. Crickets can lay eggs in there. I mean, all different kinds of bugs. So I'll maybe scrape off the top of my pot. I hose it down with the garden hose. I mean, like, really wash that plant well and then i kind of put it in a holding area sometimes in my garage for like overnight 24 hours 48 hours and then i bring it into my basement so it's getting acclimated from maybe 30 degree weather to 55 degree weather then 65 degree weather and then when it comes to watering it um i 
after I've washed it, I don't have to water it probably for a good month because I'm letting it start to slow down. And then from there, it's probably about a cup to two cups of water a month for me that I will water them. I, it will depend on how dry the soil is, how, where, where, you, where do you have it in your house? Is it right next to a heating vent? Is it next to a sunny window? You know, where do you have it? The north side of your house. So it makes a difference inside how much daylight it's gonna get. And that's when you know if it needs more daylight, it starts getting very leggy and they start just going. Mm, okay, okay, I've had that happen. She wrote back, she said, cactus and something, I don't know, but it's alive kinda. <laughs> and then she said that uh, it was my daughter's she left with me before, or she left with me before she left, yeah. Heather, send me a picture of it. Just send it to me on Facebook or Facebook Messenger, and I'll take a look at it and everything. And again, she's on Facebook as uh, Becky Brumbaugh Kaiser. Kaiser. And so you can find her in my friend list, too, of course. So if you look for her there. Um, I have a question from Sarah. I have a really bee and butterfly friendly yard. Anything you would recommend to safely, safely keep the pests away? What kind of pests are we talking about? Aphids or? Let's see. We'll see if she's. Um, what are some of the pests that can come into a yard while we're waiting for Sarah to get back? Well, aphids are always something. And some people have a lot of problems with slugs, you know, in super wet areas. You know, um, I am very fortunate. I have hostas, probably about 100 different varieties, and never once have I had a slug problem. Hostas keep slugs away? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, no. Hostas attract slugs, but because we have a more drier, you know, it's not, the, and they're on the north side, so they're, they're just drying, more and mine are more dried out. Right. Some bugs, I, I guess I don't know exactly which bugs you're talking about, grasshoppers, uh, aphids. Yeah, that just makes me interested what kind of pests, you know, bug the bees and the butterflies besides the humans, um, <laughs> bug it, <laughs> bothering them. My biggest pest in my yard are the rabbits. Oh, the rabbits. Okay, so Sarah wrote, she said, aphids. aphids and then she said, I'm deploying 100 and, or 1,500 ladybugs this week. Oh, okay. Wow. Have you been raising ladybugs yourself? I mean, you must have been if you have that many. But I'm yes, just, um, the best thing for aphids, unfortunately, for a lot of people, did they get grossed out is just your hand. If you find aphids, you can wipe them off with your hand, a little Dawn dish soap mixed with water, a spray bottle, because that'll kind of coat them and suffocate them. A good garden hose, lift up your leaves, wash underneath your leaves very, very well, wash the tops. And again, if that's a plant that's coming in the house, make sure you don't have any larvae in there. Right. So. She said, it sounds like, uh, go to Amazon. So that's where she got them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I'm going to be putting a bunch of worms in my raised beds this year. I think yeah. soil's got good beneficial micronutrients in there. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Right. Um, Slate Queen, I love that name. I have a gopher and we just dealt with that as well. Do you have troubles with that, with all your wonderful plants? We do. We have the striped gophers and they cause havoc because they will go underground in my garden soil and they will eat vegetable you know that are growing below the ground they'll eat my tulip bulbs they just you know are havoc i know this probably isn't what a lot of people would do but because we have so many we take a five gallon pail fill it about three quarters full of water we put a thick layer of sun tip the black oil sunflower seeds on top a plank walking up to it and when the gophers decide to go jump in that pile of sunflower seeds they just don't quite get back out they don't get back out i know i know there's humane ways and i know there's none and um we've had some little rascals that have killed big trees here so right. we have different ways we've brought in people to actually you know hired someone at one point to come in because we were having so much trouble and one of them killed several trees so and we're not talking little trees we're talking some big expensive trees that have been there for years and it's heartbreaking so yeah they're they cause a lot of havoc around here and not just my yard i mean everybody's yard i you know so we I, i'm not gonna lie i don't feel bad when i'm getting rid of you know seven to ten of them you know a month i i don't feel bad at all because they uh, cause so much damage I can see you. I'm picturing you as uh, Bill Murray on Caddyshack right now. 
<laughs> the whole camouflage thing I also going. Have a pellet gun loaded too because I have a rabbit problem. Rabbit. Oh yes, the rabbits, and they will. They're here too, and they will come in and just wreak havoc. I had one jump up the steps, up my steps on the porch, paws up, and eating all of my flowers I just planted. All these annuals. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm gonna kill you, oh, Jackie. Hello, Jackie. She said, we have gophers too, but Walter the daredevil, it's her cat, thinks they are a delicacy, so that helps. Oh, you're absolutely right, Jackie. When our neighbor's cats come out, I'm like, here, kitty, 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 come on. <laughs> we, here for you. When we lived in uh, up in Washington, um, over Seattle area, so we had a lot of, um, it was like an English garden. We had so many plants. And we got a, a gopher, and I remember, I think it was a gopher. Sam Lucky will correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway our cat would go out there and sit next to the hole and she was just waiting and i mean she would sit there for so long very quietly and just wait and wait and if we came up to go oh hey is it here can you hear it she'd give us this look like way to go big human with your big feet stomping on the ground you just scared him away i had him about you you know so she was really funny with them with that, with helping us catch, and and we could always tell where they were. She would go over by the hole where you know the gopher was, or you know it was way down in there, and so we knew where to go because she would help us. Oh, Sam Lucky weighed in. It was a, yeah, this is what he said. It was. <laughs> oh yeah. So when you have moles, that actually, I mean, it's a catch twenty two because it means that you have good soil, you have good microorganisms underneath your grass your sod, you know, you go down because they're looking for grubs. So you either get rid of your grubs and they're migratory. So one year your yard is it and the next year it's your neighbors and the neighbors, you know, you like this right now, I've been looking for tunnels. Now that our snow is melted, you look for all those tunnels because you can see the rays because they've chewed out all the roots and that right. those grass will be dead, you know. Right. They were causing some problems also. So there's little, well, says little heart. He's got my little pellet gun out there and he's sitting on the back patio and he's shooting at him. Oh, and, it's like, and I, told, I said to him, I said, why does my flower pot down by the garden have, it looked like Swiss cheese. There was holes. He goes, a little striped gopher in the, and there was a mole there. And I, and I go, did you hit it or he just hit my pot? What did you do oh, he needs a straw, you know, out of the side of his mouth and an old ratty hat on just sitting there with your pellet gun. Oh, boy. I forgot to mention this one, Diane Nealon. She said, we had a lot of earwigs last year. Is that something you deal with too, Becky? Um, no, I, I, you know, knock on wood, I'm pretty lucky. Um, I don't have a lot of earwigs, but same thing with aphids. I think if you were to wash your plants, you know, like I said, a good garden hose is amazing. And if it's big enough or it's a mess, just, I mean, you wear garden gloves, people. Just go in there and pull it and wipe them off. Um, if it, you could do a little alcohol and, and I do mean like a rubbing alcohol, people, <laughs> and a yeah. cotton ball or Q-tip. <laughs> and you can actually wipe down those leaves because that'll help clean and kill those bugs, okay? Hmm. Especially when you get the white, the white fly, the sticky white stuff that you see. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, you, could, you need to kill them like that. You need to wash it off good. But Dawn dish soap and water is amazing for so many things. Oh man, I know we, when I grew up, when we had strawberry fields for a couple of years that we would work in, you know, it was mm -hmm. our summer job, you know, thanks from our dad so that we kept us out of trouble. And boy, I'd, we'd go out early in the morning, of course, and pick, you know, cause we're filling up tons of boxes for people to come and buy. And some days I would just pull my hands out and it would just be slugs all over, you know, and ooh. now I didn't wear gloves cause I don't know, they were just slugs, but yeah, it probably would have been better. <laughs> Wouldn't have been near as gross, that's for sure. There's nothing like squishing a slug by accident in your hand. Ugh. Before but. I forget, there's something I have to show everybody. Excuse me here. Just... If anybody remembers a bed oh. last year. <laughs> Let me hold that up. Just hold it for a second. There, I went wider so we could see it better. There we go. That's awesome. So you filled it with succulents. Yes, I did. Anything that can hold dirt, water, anything like that, an old boot, rain boots, um, little, gets a little mad because he said, our yard looks a little junky sometimes. I'm like, I think it's funny. Oh, but I love it. I love it. So that was last year at the, uh, 
Uh, the fan party weekend, um, what we did, Sam and I like to go out and we like to find different things to, for a raffle basket to use as the basket instead of a basket. And last year, one of the things we, we found uh, was an old bedpan. And so we took it and we, we kind of try to theme it with the different series we have. So we we put some, I believe it was uh, Undertaker, Deadwood Undertaker books and, and audio books and some other fun stuff and filled that and wrapped it all up. And it was one of the raffle um, prizes that you could, you know, put tickets in for. Um, and I can't remember, we had some really good hat box and some other fun stuff last year too. So we do try to, you know, mix it up and have fun and then give them um, money from the raffle goes to different organizations, charitable stuff like that. So it was fun. But Becky got the bedpan and then you were walking down the street afterwards. Well, you, you won something and traded with somebody that was flying who had won the bedpan, right? Or she let you. She was flying and um, she, I had won a basket, all the different popcorns and treats like that. And then a few minutes later, another person at her table won this bedpan gift. And she goes, I'm flying home and I have nothing but carry on. What am I supposed to do with this bedpan? She goes, I can take the books and stuff them in my backpack. I can do this and that. And I go, I'll take the bedpan. Are you kidding me? And of course, my husband's just going. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I go, he goes, what are you going to do with it? I says, what do you think I'm going to do with it? It'll hold some succulents. <laughs> <laughs> It'll hold succulents. Walking down Main Street. Well, not Main Street, but, you know, Deadwood there. And this photographer from New York stops me and goes, um, I just have to ask, why are you walking down the streets here with a bedpan? I go, I just want it. <laughs> and of course, it's autographed by Ann and Sam Lucky. So, I mean, he's like, so he had to ask, who is that? So I told him. <laughs> that was just, awesome. He said he's going to put it in a book somewhere. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Oh, I have to plug this in quick. Jackie said, or get bantam chickens for <laughs> earwigs. Yum. Yeah, because they love any kind of bugs, aphids, worms, anything that they can peck at. That'd be awesome. So uh, chickens don't necessarily eat on any of your plants out there. I mean, if you had a farm, if you had the area in the yard and you're not in a you know subdivision that says no chickens or goats allowed, right? So, right. but will they take care or will they over, you know, will they get into other plants and cause problems? chickens like to peck at melons if you've got a melon that's getting ripe they're going to smell that just like anybody else and they'll they love a good melon they love all your leafy lettuces you know any kind of vegetables that you say you're cutting off leaves you're cleaning up for the bring them in they'd be pecking the heck out of it they yeah, love it. they love that stuff yeah. anybody else have any other questions for becky um about any problems any anything with plants anything regarding your zone oh wait i just found one sorry i meant to ask you this do you ever deal with air plants melissa asked you know i had one a couple years ago and i have to tell you i somehow i killed it um i think the problem was that we, my daughter gave it to me and it was a really cool piece of driftwood with a little pocket and it had this thing but it had a magnet on the back and so she stuck it in on the bedroom window not even thinking it was a northwest corner of my house. So that window could be 35 below zero on the outside. Wow. So I think the cold, and I mean, I felt so bad, but I was like, I killed an air plant. How am I? <laughs> Master gardener, I killed an air plant. <laughs> but <laughs> God, <laughs> I just said, I, I had, a, I confessed and I said, I killed an air plant. She's like, well, I'm not going to buy you another one. And I'm like, <laughs> in a different window or something you know right right and melissa said i did too so oh. there you go <laughs> everything is trial and error don't be afraid if you kill something once it's okay it really is i mean it's all a learning experience about gardening i'm right. not a formal gardener i some of you'll say you can't put those two plants next to each other and i'm like why and i do and right. it either works out great or it doesn't you know Right, right. So I forgot to throw this out there, Mark, when we were talking about um, the moles and the gophers, but we, we had it in the, it is in the book, cookbook. We do have a recipe in the in Charles cookbook for gopher something, right? Oh, that's funny. I mean, I've had a lot of jerky, you know, uh, we <laughs> using rabbits. So we had rabbit jerky all the time. It was delish. Really? Yeah. I haven't, uh, well, it makes sense. I mean, um, but I, I guess I've had other kinds like deer and, and, you know, the regular jerky buffalo, but not that. Yeah. So 
If anyone else has any questions for Becky, you can either ask here and we'll come back to it, or you can always reach out to her on Facebook. Um, and, and, or you can come to the Deadwood fan party this year in October and see her, meet her in person. And she would be happy, I'm sure, to talk to you about um, anything you have question-wise for that. But I want to switch over now and I want to talk a little bit about Mexico. Yes. And first, what is this that you shared? Just more plants down there? No, this is Cinco de Mayo. Oh, so, okay. You know, when they're celebrating the dead. Um, oh, wait, no, you mean... Like, you know, like Day of the Dead, I should say. Day of the Dead, that's what I meant. Yeah, okay. Um, I was down there, well, last couple of Novembers, and it's a big deal. So this is at the hotel I'm staying at, and this is donations from people, the employees, and then uh, even some guests might have something that they're coming in, bringing in. You'll see food gifts there, candles. Uh, you see a little bottle of tequila in there. They're just honoring their dead, it's, you know, like, like we do here, Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Right, right, right. So the Day of the Dead. Okay. Um, tell me, so one thing you do multiple times a year is you do go down to Mexico and you enjoy you know you have a resort that you're part of it's like you're you, you I, what is that called when you've paid into well it's a vacation club it's not like that's it here i can go uh, i could go 52 weeks out of the year except for the i should say week of christmas because that's their holy week down there and the hotels down there a lot of them leave that week for their employees and children oh nice um, stay for a vacation so, but otherwise, I go down there um, several different places. We love Cozumel. We love Playa del Carmen area. The beaches are fabulous down there. And it's kind of funny. You can go two miles apart from each other. One is very dense jungle, humidity, rainforest. And then all of a sudden, it's arid two miles away. Wow. It's, yeah, because of the foliage. I mean, it's just, it's. It's amazing because I can stay at this one resort all the time. I'm like, why is it rain here every single day? But yet two months on the road, they haven't got a drop of rain. So it's just that. So the, it holds it. Holds so the, the garden, the master gardener in you must love seeing all the variety of plants that are down there. Oh, I, I, I am. My kids used to say, uh, seriously, um, let's move on. I'm like, hey, did you look at that bougainvillea there? Oh my God, look at this plant. And they're like, no, you're not taking it home. <laughs> Keep I'm going. Afraid. I can't take it home. But I'll have you know that there's been maybe a couple little plants now and then that have maybe made it back in my luggage. Little baby shoots of something when they're hacking them all down, cleaning up, you know, trails. Right. So I'll take it home and set it, forget it, throw it in some dirt, and all of a sudden it's growing. Huh. So in those, you probably have to keep inside more and just um, well, no, protect them. Bring them, outside. bring them outside all year long, except for their, you know, like November, I have to bring them in because obviously you know, Cozumel doesn't experience 30 degrees. Right, right. Yeah. They don't get what you... 45, 50, maybe. Right, right. So what are some of the things you've done down there outside of just admiring all the plant life and all that good stuff? You Have you done the where you go swimming in a cenote or scuba diving? Have you done that? Yes, I've been in several cenotes uh, through the Dominican Republic has cenotes. Cozumel has some. And then in Playa, they actually, I mean, I've swam in them and explored them, but they also have a cenote that's been dried out for, they figured, maybe several hundred years. Now it's a restaurant. Oh, so wow. It was amazing to go see what they did, different levels. You come down to different levels, and they'd have all these little rooms and alcoves that you just go in. And and the stalagmites that you have hanging down from the ceiling are just beyond amazing. So this was where was where this, this was in Playa del Carmen. Playa it, del Carmen. They take you to the spot. You're driving through this back end alley of this neighborhood. And you're like, where the heck am I going? And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa. So you walk into this garden area. Then all of a sudden there's just steep steps going down. Yeah. So it, it's, it's amazing. It's super cool. The food was excellent. It was just fun to do. But uh, as far as swimming in there, uh, the different cenotes I've been into, it's really cool. And all I can think about, because I've read so many Mayan books, even yours, you know, is I'm, I'm thinking, okay, the Mayans were here. They were probably, they were in here. And how many dead bodies are 
um, here. <laughs> well, you have seen, you know, I've seen just different programs where they show, you know, they used to make offerings down there. And yeah, they did take some, they did some of their debtor down there. So, and it's amazing how deep they would go knowing they didn't have any, you know, spare oxygen. They were just going down in and taking stuff down. It's incredible what's down there now. Right, exactly. And I've been in a couple of them where it's kind of like a river and where you feel something swim past you, brush up the side of your leg and you're like, and I'm like looking back thinking, did we'll just like do that? Like 20 <laughs> yards behind me, you know, swimming. <laughs> okay, that was a fish. I'm going to go with it, it was a fish. <laughs> I'm just going to stick with that because, yeah. oh boy. So oh. have you went to see it? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something more? Oh, I was going to say, have you gone to see some of the different ruins around there? Yes, uh, the Chichenese, and I've been there. Yeah. And, you know, all I can say is, I don't care if it's a cold day in Mexico. When you're there, it's hot. <laughs> it's just hot. <laughs> you're just in this area, this flat ground, and I think the rocks just, you know, just absorb the heat. You know, and back in the day, you used to be able to walk all the way up, you know, and come down. And now some of that's kind of protected right now because of the crumbling. Right. Think about it. I mean, it's hot. And you just stand there like in amazement going, how did they do this? You in know, this they didn't have these tools. When you start looking at some of the different things the Mayan culture did, it's beyond amazing. Beyond. Um, there's a really cool park actually in Cozumel that is down by the lighthouse. If anybody knows the south end, um, you go down there. It's called the old, it's the Mayan hurricane. It's their, their, how they detected their weather. Mm -hmm. If you guys have all seen it, it kind of looks like a like a round shaped igloo with mm -hmm. holes, exactly north, east, south, and west, like little cutouts. When that wind comes through there just right, it makes a certain pitch. And the, they would know, that we're talking, you know, 1,200 years ago, they would know to send a message to the next village, to the next village, the next village, go out on their fishing boats and let everybody know, a hurricane's coming, you have like three days time. Wow, they just knew it. And turned. I mean, and they were accurate all the time. <coughs> That's just amazing. I hadn't heard about that and anything like that. I do, you know, I'm in love with that culture. So I'm always reading and reading, you know, whenever I can, um, especially when I'm working on a dig site book. But man, that's kind of fun. I love that idea that even there, I knew their calendars are incredible um their yes. structures the engineering is incredible they're just amazing on what they, they were, did without computers or anything they were so beyond their you know before their time right right yeah. and the biggest thing one of the biggest insults you could ever do when you're down there is to come up to, especially in cozumel because there's a lot of there's 200 original families and some of them are Mayan. And you can tell the difference. You don't say, oh, you're Mexican. No, mm -hmm. they're Mayan. And they want to, and they are so proud of their heritage, and rightly so. So I love it because where I go in my hotel, there's several Mayan families that worked there through the 20 years. And I'll never forget the first time I came up to them, I said, you're Mayan, aren't you? They're like, how could you tell? And I, well, you can tell by their facial features mm -hmm. and just the way they carry themselves and very soft-spoken um just just beautiful people and so they're very very proud of it so never just come up and want to say hey you're mexican right 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 i'm sure that's yeah well they've they've worked hard to stay alive through it all and yes. keep their culture going right and, and if you talk to them about they'll be more than happy to share any of their culture and heritage right down to cooking recipes in fact there's been times where they'll say hey this is where we're going Sunday for family dinner. Come join us. And look, I love that. We love, we call it getting off the reservation. Getting, and, yeah, and going off into. Because oh. I want the authentic. I don't want, oh, here's the American taco. No, I want the real deal. Right, right. better than learning how they cook. And what, and of course, then I might get to see a garden. I might get to see some foliage. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you might get to enjoy that. Yes. Joyce said she got to drive around Cozumel in the early 80s. It was amazing. How big of an island are we talking about? It's about 17 miles, you know. So um, half of it is pretty much jungle. You know, it's only the outer edge. It, the, the airport's on the north end, which is where the ferry goes straight across to Playa, 12 miles across. 
Okay. And then when you go to the south, it, so where I stay at is almost at the far end of the south. There's only a couple hotels down there. That's the most most amazing uh, coral reefs out there, the second largest coral reef. Mm. A lot of that's, um, they're losing it. Mm. Cruise ships, garbage, it destroys the coral reef. So that's real sad. Right, right. But, um, yeah, then they have, of course, tequila farms, not as big as what, say, mid-Mexico does, but, you know, some different fun things to see out there. They have they have a ton of alligators down there. Oh, and wow. Right through a lagoon. Huh. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many things to see and do. Don't just go to the commercial things. Right, right. Go off. That's where they have on the, on the what, I should say, east side of the island, a lot of that's protected for all the turtles. Hmm. As the turtles, that's where they come and lay their eggs and they're, they're you want to, they're endangered, some of them. Right, right. So, you know, a lot of people go, well, I don't want to go to Mexico because of the crime. I'm afraid of, you know, it's too dangerous. You've been down there a lot, even through, uh, you know, some of the times during COVID you were down there and, you know, yeah. so what was, what is the, you know, do you feel ever uneasy down there? Or are you always like, oh no, just don't go in this part of the city or this part of the, you know, island and you'll be fine. Well, un unfortunately, um, just like here in the United States, at some areas in Mexico have become very political and it's between turf wars between the drug cartels. The drug cartels really don't bother Cozumel. Um, they take their crime over, they're pretty serious. Not only if you get convicted of certain crimes, your whole family can be mooted off the island. Mm. And tell that to grandma who's been living there, you know, for yeah. years, that she just lost her home. Right, right. So, but anyways, um, Cosmo never, I mean, I can leave my Kindle sitting out on my lawn chair on the beach and it'll still be there eight hours later. So mm. you, you feel safe that way. In Playa, um, there's certain things I won't do late at night, certain areas of town I won't go through, but I do the same thing here in Minneapolis. Right. Right? You just don't go there in certain areas and by yourself because you can be a target. But right. no, we've always felt so safe walking up and down the beaches and talking to people and just, you know, exploring that way. Very, very safe. Someday, Becky, I'm coming down there with you. And yeah. Sam and I are coming down. So get ready. We're going to join you. And then we're going to be in all those wonderful pictures that you put on Facebook that I just drool about and I'm so jealous about. So I do, I'm, I want to go into one more thing. Uh, but before we go over to talk a little paranormal, I'm going to let everybody know. So we're, when we're all done, those of you who have um, commented and participated and asked questions, thank you so much. And we have some fun prizes we're going to do. Um, we'll be doing, after we shut down, then we go and compile everybody's names and we do some random drawings. One of them, again, Mark and Michelle have made another Ann and a fan mug that you're going to, somebody can win. So that's one of them. And then I, we're also, I always do this. Okay. Um, somebody will win, make no bones about it. And somebody else will win. Look, <laughs> and then I have some really fun coasters. A few people will, you know, win too. It's she's, I'm really bad today. So there we go. So I've, we have some fun coasters with the old sun that my brother drew and we'll, draw some names and mail those out in the next week. So, and if you're watching and you haven't commented yet, there's still a little time because I want to talk about one more thing and it's going to put us over a little bit on time. But one other thing that I talk to Becky about every time when I see her is we talk about paranormal fun stuff because Becky is, um, I wrote down what I would call you and it was nice. Um, darn, I can't find it, but you're, you're just like a magnet for paranormal. So tell us a couple fun things that um, you've experienced that either in Deadwood or not, but just give us a few stories to end up with today. Well, yeah, even as a young child and growing up, say a good family friend or, you know, somebody would pass and it could be months later, could be even a year later. And I would hear them whispering, telling me things like, and I'd be like, wait a minute, you know, that's so-and-so, you know? So, and then, you know how you don't think about that and you grow up and you get older. And then I, I moved, I was living in a house in Minnesota and I had some, I had a spirit that was there and he was very angry and 
And finally, I had to have, like, we're like duking it out, basically. I just said, look, you can't come in my house every night at 2 o'clock in the morning, leave the front door open, leave the refrigerator open, spoiling my milk, and leaving the snack cabinet open. we got to, we got to come to a conclusion here, you know. You can come in my home, but shut the cabinet's doors after you. Because I kept yelling at my kids to go, why is the refrigerator door open? Why is the snack door open? You know? And after we had this conversation, it never happened again. Well, a couple of weeks after this finally kind of stopped this noise every night at 2 o'clock in the morning, a friend of mine stopped by and he goes, you know, my uncle used to live here. His wife shot him and killed him here right in your kitchen. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Ooh. I go, and he was a cop, and he came home every night at 2 o'clock in the morning and would go to the fridge, go to the snacks, you know, get a little something, you know, unwind, and then go to bed. I'm like, well, he's still here, but we're, we've come to an understanding, and so we're okay. And then a few years go by, and I start coming up to Deadwood, thanks to Anne. And I started staying at a place a friend of ours owns. If those of you who know the South Dakota Gaming Commission, kind of kitty corner from the VFW there and the courthouse. She's the right next to where Calamity Jane Realty is. She's yes. like two buildings down, aren't you? So upstairs, it, well, it used to be a funeral parlor but way back in the day. And now it's kind of like a, a rustic um, apartment building. Very, very rough up there. But I love it because it's perfect for me to walk and it's just perfect. We just love it. So anyways, um, there's been times when out there by myself, they don't seem to bother me as much when Lowell's there for whatever reason. But there's just things that happen. Um, they throw a toilet caddy, you know, the toilet scrub brush across the room on you. And, <laughs> and <laughs> creep, those of you who know Kim Bauman, she, she's experienced out there too. She goes, there's like a clown-like face staring at me from this closet. Oh, a clown thing. <laughs> Or there's times I just, I also I'll sit up in bed and every light is on in this whole apartment. And I'm like, seriously, people, I'm trying to sleep there. <laughs> things like that, you know, and it's nothing like mean, it's just mischievous. There's a time they threw, they had a whole can of Coke come flying out of the closet and explode in front of my kids. And they were just, because they just asked me for uh, proof. Like, mom, you're crazy. It's not haunted. I think they did it just to say, shut up. Yeah. That's right. We're here. We're here. Yeah. Yeah. And there's times that if I'm out there and I, it's going to be a late night, I'm coming home, maybe from the casino. Um, I'll just walk in there. I'm like, I'm home and shut the hell up, everybody, because um, I need my sleep. I'm tired. It's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Leave me be. It's a night. Wait till the morning. Yeah. Then you can be active. Yeah, they just do silly things like that. But yeah, it kind of freaks out a lot of people because they always say there's somebody coming out of the closet. And I'm like, <sighs> So yeah. you've gotten used to it. So if you see anything like that, it's like, knock well, it off. I get. I guess, you know, if I wouldn't have had that experience with, you know, the other house and that kind of thing, um, or having your grandma always talking to you in your ear, that kind of thing, whatever. And um, I had a, it, it was good and kind of a, just a little, little scary experience with Danny Butler. You know, she was the medium out there last oh, year yeah. party. And I talked with her and I had had just had a really good friend of mine pass away like three months before that. And the, I, I thought if anybody's going to talk to me, it's going to be my dad. My dad just passed, you know, it's going to be my dad. Nope. It was Sherry. She had a lot to tell me. And I was just like, I'm not saying it was a skeptic, but it was just so weird to hear somebody say all these things about our conversations that I had with her. Right. You know, right. It, it was so spot on and with the kids and that kind of thing. And, um, yeah, it was, you know, it's just a different experience to have that. Right. Right. And Danny Butler is, she is a medium and you can find her online and darn it, Becky, do you remember what her online, uh, she's a business through Facebook yeah. and I'm trying to remember what it is, but I can't on my Facebook page. Um, I think you can just look up Danny Butler. Yeah. Danny Butler. Yeah, and you'll see it because she she will do online readings, Zoom mm -hmm. call readings. You can be out there. She's like out in Spearfish, Dead, but she'll she's all over. Yeah, she works with the Black Hills Paranormal uh, Investigator team, which we had last year as guests at the fan party, mm -hmm. and we've worked with them. We've done stuff with them several years because we've done. Uh, they do investigations at some of the haunted places there in Deadwood, and you can 
join up, you know, you pay so much for a ticket and you join and you be part of the investigative team, which is really fun because we get to hold all kinds of, you yes. know, ghost detecting things. Did you do the one last year with at the brothel? I did. No, no, not at the brothel. I did it at the Adams House the year before that. The year before when we did the, and we are doing the Adams House again this year uh, in October. So it'll be getting close to Halloween, which will be a lot of fun, but we're doing a couple of tours that you can sign up for if you're coming to the Deadwood um, Fan Party Week. So we'll we'll have more information on that as we get closer. But uh, and Danny Joe then is at the very tippy top of the Adams, the old haunted Adams house. In what is that? Is it a smoking room or something like that? They call it way up there at the top of the, like a widow's peak kind of a thing. Or that's what they said. The men would go up there back in the day. Back in the day, and yeah, and do, and so she'll be up there doing um, online or online readings, <laughs> readings, uh, if you want to include that in part of the fun that you do that night. Um, and I think that goes to like midnight or something. She, she does it. So yeah, she's a wonderful, she's so wonderful and fun and just makes you feel calm when you're around her. I don't know what it is about her, but it's, well, it's probably what she does. She's just very calming. She was amazing. Um, with the reading, you know, that I had in even in 10 minutes, I couldn't believe the stuff she she had shared with me. Yeah, yeah. She she brings you to tears. People who kept coming out of the room and everybody, you know, you come out all red eyed because of what you learned or what who you you know came to talk yeah. through her. It was really incredible. Um, I have not done it personally yet. Uh, that we're always so busy that week that it's just never and then we're always usually hosting so I don't really go inside, you know, go away and, and do that. So um, any of you thinking about coming to the fan party? It's so much fun. It's not just, you know, come, we have book signings, we have all that, but it's just the people you meet, right, Becky? I mean, some of your friends that I know you hang out with a lot now have come through meeting them at the, you know, during the week. And, you know, it's been amazing. And thank you for that, Anne. You know, because of you, you brought so many people together that you, you wouldn't have met otherwise, you know, and it's right. all of life and and i appreciate that because it's so much fun to see how people live in different parts of the country but we have obviously some things in common right we share i always think we share a sense of humor and that's a really good basis for a friendship no matter where you fall on any of the you know politics religion anything that sense of humor brings us all together and it makes it kind of fun and wonderful and it feels i think more safe when we just keep it you know we're having a good time with that that week so Anyway, yeah, and I'll be posting more about that. Um, I know usually we had it in at the end of June, early July, but we pushed it back to October this year because it was just getting so expensive hotel-wise for everybody to try to be there in the midst of everything else that Deadwood right. does because it's such a busy town. For a tiny town, it is incredibly busy with tourists and fun events and concerts. So, yeah, so stay tuned if you're interested in that. And And if you can't go this year, There'll be other years. We keep doing this. And um, Riley got me through grad, grad school. I remember, I think you wrote me about that, didn't you? Because I remember talking to you. I'm pretty sure because I remember you're the Slay Queen. But anyway, yeah, she, keep you uplifted, keep you laughing. That's always the goal with her crazy life. Um, so I think I got, oh, thank you for, about the amazing books. I appreciate that. And we did have fun, um, Michelle and Mark and everybody that comes um it's all about coming, having fun. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be like a, oh, I'm out going, you know, I like to go partying every night. You can just be average Joe with just come and hang out and, and enjoy the times. Becky had a really good idea. We're going to see if we can find tequila tasting in Deadwood this time. Find a place that we can go and taste some different ones of those. And you don't have to drink if you don't want to, but you can still just come and hang out and laugh at the rest of us, you know, as we make the faces that come with tequila often. You know, a lot of times. So anyhow, um, I got one more. We just discovered you love them. Hope to come to fan weekend. That would be awesome, Wendy. It'd be fun. Um, there's a lot of us old timers there, but we always like to have, you know, new people come and get to meet new people and get to know you from wherever you're at and um, share in the experience. So exactly. Becky, anything yeah. else you want to add before we? Well, just if people have any questions that they want to send to me, go ahead and send to me, you know, let me know. If you have a picture of your plant you have a specific question on or you know what zone that it's important for me when i answer you back and I'll do yeah. my best. 
Well, that's that's all. I mean, that's awesome that you're out there and you're available like that. So, we posted her name up earlier in the string um, in the comments, I believe. And if you you have a question later and you can't remember, just let me know and I can give you her name. And then maybe if you contact her privately, you just say, uh, "I saw your Anna and a fan, so she knows where you're coming from." But yeah, Becky's awesome. She's a lot of fun. She's full of so much information, and she picks really good drinks. And um, she makes really good drinks too for you. So we have maybe, a great time. Maybe your next recipe book drink or recipe book instead of food, maybe it's you pair a drink with Ooh, I like that. Did you hear that, Mark and Michelle? I know you guys are watching. So that's a good idea. We could have a chapter someday that's dinner and drinks or something, you know, like that. And then have some stuff with fun drinks too. That would be great. So thank you all for coming. Um, it was fun to be on here with Becky. Gosh, so much stuff today with all the gardening stuff. My brain's just reeling and um, all the fun stuff with Mexico. Now I want to go down there and see that hur hurricane igloo or the, the building where that right. I really want to see that. So I yeah. really need to get our kids driving, Becky, so that we can say, stay home, drive yourself to school for a week or two. We're going with Becky and Lowell down to Mexico. We'll write, you know. There's Fine. food. There's food around in the pantry. Go looking at it. Uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. And afterwards, I will go on and um, I will I will email those of you who win in the drawing. I, if I can remember, I'll put it on this main string on Facebook. But we'll let you know if you win, and then we'll get your send me your your mailing address privately, and we'll get that off to you. So thank you all, and goodbye. And we'll see you in a couple more weeks when we do another Anna and a fan. Bye. Bye.